We are so excited to have you here today. So Lucille is finishing her finishing her PhD in Wageningen. and she's going to defend in December. So this is like a good practice, I guess. Also, <laughs> to, true. Yeah. To defense. Um, so Lucille's finishing her PhD at Wageningen mm -hmm. University in the Netherlands in the Physical Chemistry and Soft Matter Group um, with Joris Breckel. And she's gonna to talk to us today about um, her work building microviscosity uh, measurement technology for plant cells um, using these molecular rotors, as you can see from the title. And um, I'll put a link in the chat for the PNAS paper that came out last year that sort of lays a lot of the foundations in case people want some more background on it afterwards. It's really, really cool, interesting, innovative tech, and we're so excited to hear from her. Um, Lucille is French originally, and she pursued her first degrees at, in Paris at ESPCI, sort of more physical chemistry based area, polymer chemistry, and then moved to Wageningen at the end of her master's for her practical at the end, and then pursued her PhD there. So she's been, I mean, I suspect the plant folks on the call know that this work that Lucille's going to talk about is also in collaboration with Dolph Byers group. It's a plant science group that many of us know very well. And we are super excited to hear from you, Lucille. Lucille's asked if we can hold questions until the end. <clears throat> so, but you're welcome to put questions in the chat as we go along like normal or hold them until the end as you wish. So. Lucille, if you're ready, we're super excited to have you here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this enthusiastic uh, introduction. Um, so uh, I would like to thank you the, to thank the CMB committee as well for inviting me to present. That's also uh, pretty exciting to me. Um, and uh, so basically today I'm going to talk about the main outcomes of my PhD project. Um, that was indeed carried out in Wageningen University at the uh, Laboratory of Physical Chemistry and Soft Matter. Um, so I'm initially more of a physical chemist, but uh, my supervisor um, wanted the lab to take a more uh, mechanobiology turn. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of what I've been doing. Uh, so I think um, there's no need to having read my paper beforehand, because I will go a bit into the basics of it. Um, yeah, so that's it. So basically, the, the goal of my PhD was to develop new fluorescent dyes to visualize mechanical patterns in plant cells and tissues. So to do that, I have worked at the interface between the physical chemistry of fluorescent dyes and plant mechanobiology. So the motor of this research was to design new tools uh, that could provide insight into the role of mechanical cues uh, in cellular processes. And more specifically, we worked on a specific type of mechanosensors um, that you see here, um, which is a molecular rotor that can reveal so-called microviscosity uh, patterns in cells. So, but then why looking at microviscosity? So microviscosity in cells is going to determine the rate of diffusion of molecules uh, and organelles. So it has a direct, direct impact on cellular processes uh, that, require, that require transport and signaling and cellular metabolism. And in this context, if we look at the special variations in microviscosity, we could uh, eventually get information on the cellular dynamics that are involved. Uh, but I will come back to the notion of microviscosity a bit later, uh, because it's a term that hides uh, different notions. So in recent years, pe people have started to use uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, or FLIM, in combination with molecular rotors to assess microviscosity non-invasively and with a good spatial resolution. So molecular rotors are these small fluorophores. You see a couple here. Uh, I'm trying to use the laser pointer, yeah. Um, which are made of two or more subunits that can rotate with respect to each other and whose fluorescent properties, such as quantum yield and fluorescence lifetime, vary in response to changes in the microviscosity of their direct environment. 
So just a little recap about FLIM with this molecular rotor uh, for those who might not be familiar with it. Um, in a typical FLIM experiment, uh, the biological sample is incubated with one of these rotors. And then under a confocal microscope, uh, the, the fluorescent dyes are excited under a pulsed laser. And after each pulse in each pixel, uh, a photon emitted by the rotor can be collected with the information of its time of arrival. Um, and if we, um, if we collect these photons over a certain period of time, we can reconstruct a distribution of photon arrival time that you can see here. Uh, so you have the number of photons, the number of counts as a function of their time of arrival. And this distribution is basically uh, the fluorescence intensity decay. And if we fit this decay with an exponential function, we can get the characteristic time with which, with which the fluorescence intensity decays back to zero. And that is the fluorescence lifetime. And this fluorescence lifetime is related to microviscosity as I'm going to, to show you in a bit. So with FLIM, we can measure the fluorescence lifetime of the rotor specially and with a special resolution that is in theory uh, only limited by light diffraction. So during the past 10, 50 years, uh, 15 years, sorry, work has been done mainly on BODP-based molecular rotors, which are made of a boron dipyromethane uh, framework covalently bound to a phenyl unit. And these two subunits can rotate with respect to each other. How it works is that, um, so in the ground state, these two subunits have a certain angle with respect to each other. Here I wrote 55 degrees. Uh, this angle varies a bit in literature uh, between roughly 49 and 58 uh, degrees. So when excited um, to decay back to the ground state, this molecule has two options. So it can either decay back radiatively by emitting a photon, or it can undergo a non-radiative decay by twisting its two subunits and reaching a planar configuration, and then uh, go back to the ground state without photon emission. So the rate of this rotation is directly affected by the microviscosity of the environment or in other words, by uh, the local constraint on the rotation. So the competition that arises between these two decay paths leads to microviscosity dependent uh, photophysical properties. And in particular, uh, the fluorescence lifetime of the molecule is going to vary. As the microviscosity increases, the rotation is more constrained and therefore the fluorescence lifetime is going to increase. So, this property has been used in the past to measure microviscosity uh, in the plasma membrane of isolated mammalian cells mainly, but so far never in other compartments than the plasma membrane. And it had never been implemented in non-animal systems. So we were more interested in plants because we had the opportunity to collaborate with doll virus as well. Um, and investigating microviscosity in plants is a challenge of interest since the, the development mechanisms are quite different than animal cells. And uh, the fact that the cells are surrounded by a, a stiff cell wall and they cannot rearrange makes it uh, uh, pretty interesting. So the goal of my project was to develop a toolbox of molecular rotors able to report microviscosity patterns uh, throughout the entire plant cells not only within membranes, but within compartments of very different physical chemical composition. And to do so, I synthesized four BODP-based molecular rotors mm -hmm. that you see here, each one designed to target a specific building block uh, in the cell. <clears throat> so to target the cell wall, um, we functionalized uh, the rotor uh, basic unit with a peptide that is known to bind to pectin. So we expected it to uh, target the primary cell wall and the middle lamina. To target uh, the plasma membrane, uh, we synthesized this rotor that's, so by following a protocol that already exists in literature, the molecule is slightly different in literature, but a very minor change. Um, and it intercalates 
in the plasma membrane uh, since it has this um, long aliphatic tail and this amphiphilic character. It interacts uh, electrostatically with the negatively charged phospholipids of the membrane. Uh, so it stays in between the phospholipid tails. To target the cytoplasm, we use this one, um, which is pegylated. So it's, it's, it should, in theory, not stick to the cell wall and plasma membrane, uh, but it should be bulky enough not to diffuse well, or to diffuse very slowly inside the vacuoles. So we don't stain the vacuoles. Uh, and to stain the vacuole, we used uh, a small negatively charged dye that would diffuse easily across the, the cell wall and membrane barriers. Um, so to check the responsiveness of these rotors after functionalization, because these chemical functionalizations can uh, impact uh, the energy levels of the molecule and suppress the responsiveness to microviscosity. So to check whether they were still responsive, we recorded uh, their fluorescence lifetime in solutions of glycerol and water with different microscopic viscosities. So here you see the lifetime as a function of the viscosity. So it's a bulk viscosity, it's not a micro viscosity. Um, but as expected, as the viscosity increases, the micro viscosity also increases locally and you get this increase uh, in fluorescence lifetime uh, with all probes. And we observe a 2.5 to eight fold uh, increase roughly in lifetime when going from one CP, the viscosity of water, to 1150 CP, uh, the viscosity of 99% glycerol. So to check the performance of these rotors in cells, uh, we, inc we first incubated uh, cells from suspension culture. Arabidopsis cells from suspension culture. And we used FLIM to record the fluorescence lifetime of the molecules specially. And we showed that they target their specific compartment with a quite high selectivity. So here you see the four FLIM maps. Um, a false color scale has been attributed to the fluorescence lifetime. So when you will see blue, it will mean a high lifetime that corresponds to high microviscosity or in other words, uh, uh, constraint on the rotation. The rotation is difficult. And in orange, you see the low lifetimes that corresponds to lower microviscosity or more uh, free volume, more space for the rotor to rotate, basically. If I plot the lifetime distribution uh, in cells, so you see here the distribution of lifetime in orange, so in cells, uh, uh, versus the lifetime distribution in an homogeneous aqueous medium in gray. Uh, you can see that, so in the vacuole, these two, these two distributions are superposed. And that's basically because in the vacuole, we are sensing the microviscosity of water. The vacuole is a, a, a non-crowded aqueous compartment. But in the other compartments, we see a big increase in lifetime and a broadening of the distribution that is expected in the highly heterogeneous environment. And with this, we confirmed that we are actually probing heterogeneities and not uh, statistical noise. So, but our aim was to map uh, microviscosity patterns in cells representative of what can be found in nature, so in, in, in actual tissue. So we implemented these molecules in uh, roots from Arabidopsis seedlings. Roots are good candidates to map fluorescence lifetime variations because you have a lot of cellular processes going on in the roots uh, and cells have very different uh, identities. Uh, and you also uh, have the root hairs which are quite different from the rest. So we chose this uh, as a model system kind of. So this is the kind of images you get with these probes in these roots. Um, so with the vacuum probe, the fluorescence lifetime does not really change, especially uh, since the probe goes into the aqueous compartments and the microviscosity that doesn't vary much within these compartments. But we can use the intensity signal to map the evolution in size and morphology of these aqueous compartments, going from water, small water pockets uh, in the apex to large rectangular vacuoles 
in the elongation region. And with the other probes, we could see clear uh, spatial variations. We focused mainly on the membrane and the cell wall because these two compartments are the one that have uh, a leading role in mechanotransduction. So now I'm going to talk a bit more into detail uh, about the, the membrane and the cell wall probes. So the membrane probe intercalates between the phospholipid tails and a change in lipid packing uh, is expected to induce a change in the rotation rate of the probe, which results in a change of fluorescence lifetime. So you can understand from that uh, what microviscosity means for the plasma membrane. It means basically lipid packing. And we wanted to check two things, whether the membrane rotor can highlight different lipid phases, uh, and second, whether it can highlight changes in membrane tension. So we did some test experiments. To check whether we could detect different lipid phases, we implemented the probe in modal membranes, that is in giant unilamellar vesicles made of sphingomyelin, DOPC, and cholesterol in this case. And here you can see that it undergoes a phase separation between a liquid ordered and a liquid disordered uh, phase. And this phase separation is analogous to what happens in biological membranes to form the, the lipid microdomains. Well, of course, we don't have proteins here, but anyway, it was to check the sensitivity to, to this uh, phase separation. And they they sh the probe shows uh, clear changes between these two. Um, phases. Because in the liquid order phase, the lipids are more tightly packed and therefore the rotation is more constrained. Now to check the sensitivity of the rotor to changes in membrane tension, we performed experiments on cells from suspension culture, shocking them hyperosmotically and monitoring the change in lifetime uh, within the membrane. So here you see two images before and after shock. And if we plot the corresponding lifetime distributions, we can see a visible shift towards higher lifetime, um, so higher lipid packing. There is a significant change in plasma membrane tension. The plasma membrane uh, undergoes a lateral compression, and that's why you see this, uh, this shift. So if we now look at the membranes in roots, we can use these two observations to interpret what we are seeing. So here, what you can see, for instance, is the, the difference in lifetime between the meristem uh, that appears uh, as a green region here and the roots cap that is a bit more bluish. The lifetimes are quite lower in the meristem where cells are dividing and thus the membrane uh, experiences more tension. And if we now make a zoom on the young cortical cells, we can show distinct domains within the uh, lipid, lipid bilayer. You see locally some regions with higher lifetime uh, here in blue um, that corresponds to more ordered lipid microdomains. So with this body P, we could map special variations in plasma membrane microviscosity. Now, what is of interest is to highlight changes that occur due to uh, cellular processes that are going on. Um, and so a striking example is when a root hair uh, is growing or starts to grow. We didn't do uh, live imaging, unfortunately, because we didn't have the proper setup to do it. And that would be very interesting to do, though. Uh, but we took pictures of root hairs um, at different times. Uh, you can see this in a bit more detail in the publication. Um, but here you can see uh, two images of the of root hairs taken are at slightly different uh, states, stages of growth. Um, and you can see that the fluorescence lifetime is lowered in the tip of these bulges due to an increased tension and maximum curvature. It could also be due to the fusion of vesicles as endomembranes uh, tend to be globally more fluid uh, than the plasma membrane. Um, but yes, so that's the type of things we could uh, highlight with these probes uh, in the roots. I'm going to stop here with the examples. There would be more things to show, but I would like to talk a bit more about the, the wall probe. 
Um, so yeah, I will switch uh, now to the cell wall probe. Um, so as I said, to target the cell wall, uh, we functionalize the molecular rotor with uh, pectin binding peptide. Um, so we, we expect to target the primary wall and the, the middle lamina. So in the cell wall, when we are talking about microviscosity, we are actually referring to mesh size uh, or pore size. So the bigger the mesh size, the easier it is for the rotor to rotate and therefore the lower the fluorescence lifetime. So in this situation where you have a big mesh, uh, the lifetime will be short because the, the rotation is easy. Well, when the wall is more dense, then it will, the lifetime will rise. So we did the same kind of experiments uh, as with the plasma membrane probe. Here you see three confocal images taken in different regions uh, along the roots. So the probe did not get internalized in the apex. That's because uh, the cell walls in the apex has very, are very thin uh, and made of a dense pectin network, which does not favor diffusion of the probe. But efforts in our lab are currently being made uh, to make a new cell wall probe with better internalization. In the transition region, you can see that the probe is starting to get internalized and that the lifetime is decreasing as you go up the route. And that's because in this region um, where the cell want to elongate, um, there is a loosening of the cell wall, which is needed for the cells to elongate upon increase in turgor pressure. We also had a look at growing root hair, uh, at slightly different stages of growth. Um, here you see three examples. Um, we highlight a higher lifetime in the tip of the hairs. Uh, it's not very clear on the images, maybe. Um, so um, roughly, so in general, uh, the lifetime in the hairs is, um, is higher than in the rest of the epiderm. And you can see also that, well, actually it's not super visible, uh, but the tip of these hairs uh, has a higher lifetime than the sides of these hairs. Um, and that's because at the tip, uh, the new wall is formed that is initially uh, denser, but more malleable. And the walls parallel to the root hair directions of growth uh, are, are less dense. And I guess that would be consistent if we consider that these walls need to yield more for their hair to grow in that direction. Um, So these were a few examples. You can form, find more in our uh, PNAS paper. Uh, I put the reference in the, at the bottom here, but uh, Shivan uh, also gave the, the reference. Um, but to summarize, these probes provide insight into mechanical and structural, structural heterogeneity on a qualitative scale at a higher resolution that cannot currently be achieved by other means. But without a suitable calibration, these film maps are not yet uh, quantitative. This is work in progress to make this, this uh, a bit more quantitative. Additionally, it's good to keep in mind what microviscosity means for a given cellular compartment and what external parameters can affect the apparent microviscosity. I could talk quite a bit about this, but because there's not that much time, it's better if we discuss this uh, after the presentation, and I'm also available by email uh, to talk about anything. So instead, I would like to show you a bit more recent data uh, where the same molecular rotors were implemented in other world systems. So since our publication in PNAS, some groups have contacted us to try these probes in their own systems. And now we have some, uh, some work going on successfully. Uh, for instance, at the Sainsbury Laboratory, uh, on the fungus Magnaporte orise, I hope I pronounced it correctly, um, which is a fungus that invades rice plants. So Lauren Ryder and Nick Talbot have been using the membrane probe um, to study the evolution in plasma membrane, membrane properties during uh, appressorium uh, development and maturation. So basically, um, this uh, Magnaporte orise, orise when landing on its hosts, um, it develops uh, specialized cells, cell that is called a pressorium. 
that is depicted in brown here and that can build up huge amounts of turgor pressure, so up to 30, 40 uh, times uh, the pressure in a car tire. So it is uh, about 8 megapascal or so, um, in order to punch through the surface and invade its host. And you can imagine that during this process, the membrane has to adapt a bit to, to accommodate such a buildup in pressure. I can unfortunately not show you images of this uh, right now, but a publication is in progress where they will highlight uh, very distinct changes in membrane properties during this uh, appressorium maturation. In parallel, we have been collaborating with the Laboratory of Phytopathology at Wageningen University, where they are focusing uh, on the biology and pathology of Oomycid pathogens, and in particular, uh, the late blight pathogen Phytophthora infestans that invades and destroys potato and tomato crops. So a previous study from our group already started to highlight the invasion mechanics of this pathogen. And we wanted to see if we could use uh, these probes to get insight into how this pathogen perceive and process mechanical stress at the substrate surface and how they respond to abiotic stress, in particular to treatment that are usually uh, used to inhibit their invasion. So we implemented the cell wall uh, and the plasma membrane probe that I talked about previously to map resp respectively the wall mesh size and the uh, plasma membrane limit spacing during non-invasive and invasive growth. So here you see uh, a 3D reconstruction of the cell wall with a color scale to represent the fluorescence lifetime. And I'm sorry, but the scale is inverted compared to before. Uh, so not to be confused, this time in red, you see the high lifetimes and in blue, you see the low lifetimes. Uh, sorry for this. Um, and so basically on this image, you can see a cell growing non-invasively on its substrate. You can see small spatial variation between the cyst, uh, the neck that has uh, a slightly looser cell wall, and the germ tube. And the lifetime is slightly higher in the tip. So the, the wall is slightly denser in the tip compared to the rest of the germ tube. And then by contrast upon invasion, um, the lifetime rises strongly and abruptly um, as the, the pathogen interacts mechanically with the substrate. The cell wall is basically compressed between the cytoplasm and the substrate. So with this approach, we could visualize directly the locus of mechanical interaction between the pathogen and its target substrate. When implementing the plasma membrane probe, however, we could not highlight any special variations, any changes uh, in lipid spacing. So this is quite different from what we saw in the membrane of the invading fungus Magna Porte orizae, where you could see really uh, clear changes. And that confirms the big difference uh, between the entry mechanics of oomycete and fungi. Now we were still wondering whether this absence of variation uh, was due to the absence of changes in lipid spacing or uh, to the, the, sensitivity, the sensitivity of the probe that does not ma uh, match uh, the variation range. So to study this further, we use another probe that I'm going to introduce now. This probe is called NR12S. So it's based on a nail red unit. It has been developed by a laboratory in Strasbourg in France. And it's a plasma membrane probe that reports variations in chemical polarity. Uh, so it works in a completely different way uh, from the molecular rotors. I'm going to uh, explain how it reports uh, chemical polarity. So basically the emission spectrum of this probe uh, is going to shift according to the local polarity. Uh, as the polarity increases, the fluorescence spectrum is shifted to, the, to higher wavelength. So if we record the fluorescence emission intensity of this probe in two channels, so a blue channel and a red channel. Um, and then we compute the ratio of the intensity in the blue channel over uh, the intensity in the red channel. Then this ratio gives us information on the local chemical polarity. 
So as the polarity increases, the ratio I blue over I red is going to decrease. So we look at this ratio. So now what affects chemical uh, polarity and therefore this ratio, apart from lipid composition, protein composition. So it's also going to be affected by uh, changes in, changes in uh, lipid order and lipid spacing. So for instance, uh, if the membrane is disordered, the spacing between the lipid tails is slightly bigger and therefore the membrane hydration will be slightly higher. So then the chemical polarity will increase. So we implemented this probe in Phytophthora cells. Here you see a 3D reconstruction of the plasma membrane of the cell growing non-invasively on the surface. We could also not highlight any special variations in chemical polarity. So it suggests that the plasma membrane is relatively apolar and ordered and relatively homogeneous along the whole cell. Upon invasion, um, the signal of the probe underneath the substrate surface was not uh, high enough to be able to compute a ratio accurately, but we are trying to, uh, to fix this issue uh, currently. And next to this, to study the potential use of the cell wall rotor and this chemical polarity probe in spreading fungicide action, we also mapped changes in cell wall and plasma membrane structural properties under several chemical treatments. So here I show you two examples of treatments. A treatment with fluopicolide, which is a plasma membrane targeting agent, and valiphenylate, uh, which is a cellulose synthase inhibitor. So fluopicolide has been shown to, to relocalize specific proteins uh, from the surface of the plasma membrane to the cytoplasm. And these specific proteins, as I call them, have been suggested to play a role in membrane stability uh, by providing uh, anchors to cytoskeletal proteins. So you can see that this treatment leads to drastic changes in chemical polarity you have uh, a big increase in polarity that reflects an increased hydration of the membrane. So the, the membrane has lost its tensegrity. And in parallel, uh, the cell wall does not seem to be uh, impacted that much if you compare to the control. Um, you can see a slight difference if you look at the distribution. So you compare the control and the uh, left-hand distribution after fluopicolite treatment, there is a small shift that is more likely due to the presence of DMSO. So, yeah, it, the, the change was not considered significant. Um, Valiphenylate, on the other hand, uh, is uh, an active agent that targets the cell wall, and in particular, it inhibits cellulose synthesis. So, here you see a cell that has been grown uh, one hour without treatment and one hour with valiphenylate. And you can see a clear gradient in lifetime. Um, and uh, the cell wall that has been synthesized after treatment or during treatment is denser and thinner than the one that is synthesized without treatment. So we can use this probe to decorrelate the effects on the cell wall and on the membrane and gain information on the mode of actions of these chemical treatments. Uh, we tried uh, several others than this. These are, are just examples of what we can do. So this was to show you a few examples of what can be done with these fluorescent probes and not only in plants, uh, but in other world systems. Uh, as a continuation to this research, several things need to be done. And in particular, we would like to establish a calibration uh, of the rotors that is needed if we need a more quantitative picture. Um, we are now making a new equivalent of a cell wall probe to allow for better internalization and cheaper synthesis. Uh, this is currently being done by another PhD student who, who just started. Um, yes. and. Uh, well, personally, I will stop uh, working on this uh, now. Um, I, I am now uh, switching to a more material uh, science project. Um, but 
um, I'm still continuing with collaboration with uh, other labs that want to try these probes. So on this, I would like to end my talk and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Lucille. <laughs> um, I don't know if people want to raise their hands if they have a question. Is there anybody who wants to start? Remember, you can put questions in the chat too, if it makes you feel more comfortable. Um, I want to give, you know. How, how do you raise hands? Oh, that's a great question, Guy. Uh, it's so not showing up here. Potentially down at the bottom of your Zoom window, there should be a button that says reactions. Oh, there it is. And if you click on that, you should be able to raise your hand, and then you I don't, I don't have, Oh, there! I see. I, I had the. I had the. I had the. I had the applause. I, could, I clap. That was outstanding. Oh. Oh. Give you a thumbs up as well. Lots and, of reactions. Fact, I love this. <laughs> I, I I cried. By the way, let me raise my hand here. Oh, Paul beat me to it. Paul beat you to it. Paul, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um. So I, I have two quick questions. When you showed us that 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 picture of the liposome with liquid ordered, liquid disorder domain, mm -hmm. the, the the lifetimes are better. Are, I mean, are quite different. But also the structure. I mean, the 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 line looks thicker in one than than the other. Does that have any yeah. significance? That's true. Uh, is because the the rotor has a slightly higher affinity for one of the two phases. And so it will uh, go preferably in this phase. But, uh, so, um, but, but why is the yellow line thicker than the blue line? So uh, because there's more. So it's basically because uh, there's more intensity coming from the liquid disordered phase as compared to the liquid ordered phase. It's it's not because the probe is able to partition more in the two leaflets. I mean, it doesn't have more freedom up and down. Um, it could also be that's true. Yeah, um, and that's true. It could also be that it's uh, kind of flip flops more from one uh, side to the other. Yeah, um, but. I think it's mainly a question of the intensity. Okay, okay, so that's, okay. Uh, um, and, and the other question I had was, I mean, I guess you're doing this, but the, the, the probe that's directed to the pectin, have, have you, are, are you standardizing that by just putting it in pectin gels of different mesh sizes to see if anything happens? Or, or I guess what I'm interested, if you make a pectin gel and, and subject it to uniaxial compression or shear or something, can you see non-uniform changes in the mesh size? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting point. Uh, actually, uh, I have done, but not for a long time, I have done a few experiments uh, trying to make uh, pectin gels, um, but we never managed to make a network that was tight enough to show clear uh, changes in the lifetime between the different gels. I didn't try any indentation or so, which would have been interesting, that's true. Uh, I tried to make different pectin gels with different cross-linking densities, uh, but uh, still, uh, the, because the probe measures something very locally, uh, the change in the mesh size was not uh, big enough for the probe to sense a difference. So in the, in the in vitro pectin, it looks, the probe looks like it's just in water? Uh, yes, basically. Okay. okay. But I didn't take more time to do more experiments on this. Indeed, it would have been nice to do some indentation. That's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you might be able to visualize strain fields this way. I mean, yeah. Really, right? yeah, these rotors have already been, well, not these ones, but other rotors that were hydrophobic. Uh, have been used as pressure sensors uh, in elastomers, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's go with Guy, and then there's two questions in the chat, and then we'll come back to Dan. Well, first let me say thank you. Thanks so much for being here. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, it's a rare occasion. I mean, it's, 
Now, so, sometimes, uh, sometimes you, know, you never know, these future leaders are, are going to be future leaders, but you're already in the future. You're five hours in the future. You, you actually gave us a talk from this afternoon. And I, I'm, uh, I'm so honored, honored to, to, uh, to see what the future looks like. And, and so I, I'd like to uh, ask actually a temporal question, uh, which is, uh, so, so Paul pointed out that this is, this is, it might be a nice probe for looking at strain analysis. And the, the, the two extremes for a progressive probe are either you can get great information about strain if it doesn't move so much, or if it diffuses, if it either rotates or, 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 or translates in an interesting way. You can often get material information as well just by, by fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. It, 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 are, do you have any sense as to how stable the, these are over, over, over a reasonable uh, duration of, a, of a, an experiment, like a few minutes? Is it possible to actually get some more information about mechanical properties from the way these, these probes move around within the, within the wall membrane? So are you asking if it would be possible to do uh, FCS experiment with these probes, for instance? Or, yeah. Uh, I think, well, they are pretty photostable. Uh, it could be worth trying, but I've never tried, and I'm not very familiar with FCS. Uh, but I think... Uh, well, they are known to be very photostable, so they could uh, withstand uh, uh, long illumination. Uh, how long? Uh, I don't know actually what kind of intensity you use in FCS. Uh, depends on what detector you have. Sorry. It de depends on the detector you have. Uh, but so, but. If I, if I could just ask a quick follow-on without Shabani getting too uh, getting too mad, the um, then it, it, do you have a sense as to how stable these patterns that you're observing are uh, over time? Do, do, do you do you see do you actually can you actually visualize fluorescence fluctuations or or is it um, so is spatially so stable? You mean the patterns if they are spatially stable? Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, just so. Just one uh, specification: When you take uh, a map like this, a flame map, you need to uh, record the photons for uh, like two minutes. Uh, uh, so it's already quite long. Uh, but if you take images successively, you can do this a, a couple of times and get the same image. Uh, but that's also one of the issues of this technique: is that you cannot really probe uh, fast, uh, very fast. Uh, Biological uh, phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your question. Natasha, did you want to ask your question? Or I can read it for you. It's up to you. Yay. I can ask it. Um, yeah, thank you for this. This was really great. Um, one thing I noticed right away is the um, root morphology. And I'm, I'm a person that studies roots. And I saw that the root looked a little twisted. And I was wondering if that was just kind of like a random occurrence, or if you noticed any changes in root morphology or development once you introduced any of the probes. But I was noticing that in the cell wall probe. No, yeah, it's a, it's a random uh, occurrence. I mean, um, the probe did not affect uh, visibly uh, the structure of the root. Uh, and the, they could still grow uh, after treatment uh, without any macroscopic or uh, microscopic, but uh, uh, difference. So we didn't really observe any impact of the presence of this dye on the structure and morphology. Thank you. That's always the biologist question too. It's like, hey, <laughs> is this going to do something weird to the plants? But that's cool to hear that it doesn't. Dan. Yes, uh, thank you, Lucille. Great talk, enjoyed it very much, captivating uh, subject. I wanted to ask about the, the root hair emergence and, your, and what your probe is, is, uh, is, is telling us. Um, so if I understood it correctly, the probe, uh, the, the wall is reporting a longer lifetime right where the root hair starts to emerge at, at the tip. And uh, I'm wondering, how one might interpret that. So, so in, in my world, I think of the root hair as, uh, as starting with an acidification of the cell wall, which activates expansions. There's, so there's a wall loosening process that occurs. 
and the wall starts to uh, to extend, and you get this out this this uh, bending outwards. Um, there might be other things going on too, but it, but at least that part uh, there's good documentation for that. So it's a kind of a, a loosening phenomenon. Although I lo loosening is a is a uh, a word that's used in various uh, ways. So so what do you think? So so clarify for me, please, what it's reporting. It's it's saying a longer life time. So longer and, lifetime yeah. is uh, denser wool. So here, for instance, it's not super clear on the image, um, but you have basically a denser wall uh, in the tip of the hair. Okay. Um, and globally, denser wall in the hair compared to the rest of the uh, epidermal cells. So um, that, that could be, for instance, a, a consequence of, of, uh, of the shearing of the polymers that occurs when the wall starts to extend. They may be compressed to be closer together. It could also be uh, you're changing the curvature of the wall surface there. And I imagine there might be some mechanical compression that occurs there. Is that, is that how you think of it? Actually not. Well, um, that's interesting. Well, it's probably a combination of uh, diverse uh, uh, phenomenon, but um, so how I see it is that uh, the new wall is formed there. And uh, as we saw also uh, in the in the meristematic region, the new walls that are formed are usually denser. Um, and as far as I know, uh, contain less cellulose, but a denser pectin network that is more malleable to allow for, uh, for growth. Uh, so yeah, that's how we see it, uh, a denser, but more malleable uh, pectin network uh, in this spot. And, and does the, the, uh, the, co <laughs> the color change before the, the bulge uh, becomes substantial? Uh, you mean which color chain? Uh, which uh, oh, word? is your is your probe reporting a longer lifetime before the the bulge really gets as big as what you've got there? So, so mean, at the at the start before, uh, you know, before the the, um, the bulge has progressed very far. So what we saw is that the and it's in the paper um, that the lifetime. Uh, gets lower as the root hair maturates or well, gets older uh, and longer. So um, yeah, so the, the wall is less dense in older root hairs and more dense in young bulges. Okay, thank you. And, and another quick question back to the pectin business. Did you try uh, things like oh, EDTA or pectin degrading enzymes, things of that nature to that have um, macroscopic changes in the viscosity of pectins in cell walls. Uh, did you try something like that in cell walls to see if you can make um, sense of your report? Your, your report so we didn't treat, uh, well, we tried, yeah, we tried to, to um, not, to degrade the pectin, though, we try to degrade the cellulose. Um, but uh, actually, these experiments did not give convincing results, and I didn't include pictures. Um, um, but in the paper, uh, mm. So in the paper, we, we used uh, pectin mutants, but it was imaged on the uh, cotyledon cells, not on the root. Um, so no, not really, actually. OK, thank you much. Great, great, great topic, great presentation. Thanks. There was also a question from Manuka in the chat, which was, Sort of why the potato late blight fungus was the one that was chosen. I mean, I suspect that's the collaborator's choice and not yours. But. Yeah. Huh? yeah, yeah. So basically, we we tried collaborating with uh, uh, 
everybody we could in Wageningen University and there is the Fetopathology Laboratory. Um, so we are collaborating with uh, Francine uh, Rovers uh, there. Yeah, that was more a coincidence of, uh, yeah. Sometimes that's what happens, right? It's like, who's yeah. near you? Who's next door? Which is one of the reasons we like CEMB. It brings people together in different ways. Torsten, I see your hands up. And then Ryan. Um, I was wondering about the availability of these reagents because they're obviously custom synthesized. So how easy is that, et cetera? Um, so it's actually, so all of them are quite easy to synthesize and you don't need uh, a lot for your experiments. We use very low concentrations. So uh, to try them, you can just contact uh, us. Um, just the cell wall probe it was tricky to synthesize, but now we are making a, a new equivalent that will be uh, easier to synthesize in big batches. And then we can provide also the cell wall probe. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to try it, uh, <laughs> just contact us. I bet lots of people do. <laughs> Ram. <laughs> Hi, Lucille. I really enjoyed your talk. I'll save my other question for when you need, uh, but I, I do want to ask one now since it came up. I was wondering with the uh, the Aprosorium uh, experiment, if you tried the reverse, where you had stained the plant cells with, let's say, the cell wall reporting probe, and then see how it reacts when you have this massive pressure imposed on it that's going to punch through the wall. It would be really super interesting to do this. Uh, but so this work has been done not by me, uh, by, but by Lauren. And uh, she's more interested into the, the pathogen part. But indeed, that would be great. And what would be even greater is to map both at the same time. Um, but this, for now, is not possible because we, we would need rotors that emits at two different wavelengths. And so far, they all emit green. Uh, but this is also a project for later. Uh, I know my boss wants to work on this. OK, thank you. Any other burning questions for Lucia? <laughs> I'm trying to hold mine until we talk later, but we'll see. I think one thing, so for me that I, I find, I mean, so Dan and I talk about this all the time and he keeps me on my toes, which is good. <laughs> the difference between sort of the properties of a wall, whether it's porosity or mechanical properties, whichever, when it's actually stressed. So when there's turbo pressure and it's under stress from that, like that compression that can happen, right? That we're seeing, or when it's sort of without turbo pressure and it's just chilling, and which of those are sort of like the most relevant property that you'd want to know about anyways. And so I'm guessing, you know, for this slide that's showing now where you have, this is a turgid cell, right? Where the little root hair is starting to bulge out. And so I'm guessing we didn't do any experiments where we like reduced the turgor pressure a little bit in that and saw whether or not the, it, no. No, but yeah, that's true. But on the other hand, uh... Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, that would be interesting. Um, but do you suggest that uh, that would explain why the lifetimes are suddenly higher in the in the bulge? I would expect that the turgor. Well, I, I'm not a biologist, so um, <laughs> is it possible? I mean, the turgor will apply uh, the pressure everywhere uh, in the cell. But then with some small structural changes, it would affect more the root hair uh, than the rest of the epidermal cell. I suppose if I'm just like rando theorizing, right? So generally people think there's no difference within a plant cell with respect to like turgor pressure. Although who knows? <laughs> um, but you could imagine that if the wall properties are different where that bulge is happening, right? So you've got that new pectin that's being put in there and things like this, that 
that wall, like you think, would compress more under the same yeah. amount of force as like the wall down here. And so I think this is one of the things you said when you presented this, that the, the mesh size changes because of the differential composition of the wall compressing differently in different areas, right? That was one of the hypotheses I think you put forward. And so yeah, I guess- well, we actually, we were not necessarily talking about a uh, denser wall because of compression, but- Ah, uh, okay. Uh, uh indeed uh that could be at least a partial source of uh of the difference we see we cannot really highlight what is the cause of the changes in the uh, in mesh size unfortunately um but yeah indeed indeed obviously a pretty complex property right which is with all of these things it's like okay i can see a change but trying to sort of pull out, you know, the different factors that could be contributing to that. I mean, I guess that's why we all have jobs, right? So <laughs> are there any other follow-up questions? Anybody is like has burning questions? Okay. If you want to join me in thanking Lucille one more time. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. It was it's Thank always you for listening to me. Great.